Hello and welcome to the Russia Question. I'm Michael Lesorgan, director of the Russian program at Fordham University uh, at Lincoln Center. This webinar is one of the many initiatives of Fordham's Orthodox Christian Study Center, which facilitates funds and publishes scholarship on the Orthodox Christian world broadly understood. To learn more about the center, its initiatives or publications, please visit the website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. We encourage you to follow us on YouTube and share this and other videos with anyone who might benefit from them. Today, uh, we are ex extremely fortunate to have an, a, the long-awaited interview with Sergei Plohi, uh, who joins us to discuss his The Russo-Ukrainian War, uh, which I've been uh, devouring uh, over the past month. It is, among many other things, a comprehensive analysis of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, along with Ukrainian and Russian claims, both historical and present day, to the territory that is internationally recognized as Ukraine. Sergei Plohi is the Mikhail Hrushevsky uh, Professor of Ukrainian History and the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. His interests include the intellectual, cultural, and international history of Eastern Europe with an emphasis on Ukraine. He's the author of, among others, Adams and Ashes, The Global History of Nuclear Disasters, uh, The Frontline Essays on Ukraine, uh, on Ukraine's Past and Present, Nuclear Folly, A History of the Cuban Missile Crisis, Forgotten Bastards of the Eastern Front, American Airmen Behind uh, the Soviet Lines and the Collapse of the Grand Alliance, and Chernobyl, The History of a Nuclear Catastrophe, and The Gates of Europe, A History of, U of Ukraine. His books have won numerous awards, uh, including the Bali Gifford Prize and the Shevchenko National Prize. Uh, needless to say, you'd be hard pressed to find better way to learn quickly and thoroughly about the current uh, Ukra uh, Ukraine crisis, the invasion of Ukraine. So, Sergei, I, I heartily welcome you to our webinar, and would like you to would like to give you uh, give to you the opportunity to open with a few words about your book. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm extremely pleased to appear on this on this webinar uh, because the Fordham University has special meaning for me. My dissertation, um, doctoral dissertation back in Ukraine was on the um, uh, the origins of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and the policies of papacy uh, mm. in Ukraine and Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and work by Oskar Halecki on the Union of Brest of 1596. Wow. Uh, very important for me, and it was, in my mind, certainly associated with Fordham University. So, well, well, welcome back in that case. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really... I'm really uh, in, in, Happy, happy to be and, and speak to this to this audience. Now, with regard to my book, um, I guess I will start with the uh, reasons for writing it. And uh, the, the idea to write this book was not money. Uh, it, it came from from my publisher. And when uh, it was suggested that it would be maybe a good idea, it was in March of the last year, uh, for me to, to do something like that, my answer was no. And uh, the answer was no for two reasons. The first one was that uh, emotionally I was in a state of shock. And uh, uh, to think about something that the only explanation that I had at that time was crime. And, and, and to, to think intellectually through that, things about the origins, it was complete impossibility. Yeah. And second reason was that uh, I didn't think at that time, I since changed my mind, that really historians should not write on the contemporary developments. Yeah. We are not equipped, we are basically trained in a different way. Our wisdom comes from the fact that we study already the processes that came to the completion. Mm -hmm. That provides a particular perspective. And um, then, then uh, I, over some period of time, I changed my mind and decided to write this book. 
Uh, one of the reasons was that uh, people, mostly media, but also colleagues, were turning to me, inviting on the in, in panels and webinars and asking questions for interviews. Uh, and uh, that kept going, suggesting that probably I had something to say that was important at that moment. And once I realized that I, I uh, really embarked on this very risky undertaking for a historian to write, to write a history of, of contemporary time, of history of the, of the war that is still going on, it is still going now, and certainly it was going at the time when I was writing it. And for myself, I uh, formula, uh, created a formula where I rephrased uh, Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill's uh, formula about was democracy, that this is the worst form of government, except mm -hmm. uh, every other form of government. And <laughs> I, I, I decided that historians are the worst commentators on contemporary developments, except everybody else. I was going to point to that, and, yeah. And I, I, I uh, um, sort of believe in that. Um, I, the, the subtitle of the book is The Return of History. And um, history has been written all over this, this war from the start go. Um, the the all-out aggression that began in February of 2022 uh, was uh, precipitated by the publication of uh, Vladimir Putin's essays on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians where he, of course, heavily relied on history, mis misrepresenting it or misunderstanding in, in justification of this war. Uh, the war turned out and it became clear with every passing day that it was turning into something historically very important. When I say historically very important in a sense, the changes that it actually produced. And it was clear for me, again, with every passing day that those changes are lasting ones. And uh, um, so at the end, uh, I, I tried to look at this war. I, I, I tried to document it. In many ways, I'm one of the first chroniclers of those developments, but basically putting it into a, as broad historical context and perspective as possible. And one of those aspects is, of course, looking at the users of users of history and general ideology in, in uh -huh. culture, religion, history in in the broader battles over over the issues of identity because they're at the at the core at least of the uh, declared goals of the Russian Federation in this war declared by Vladimir Putin the, the argument that Russians and uh -huh. Ukrainians are one and the same people. Uh, the argument that Ukrainians don't exist, in fact, as a separate nation is, is a core uh, argument of the essay itself and certainly many of the policies that uh, uh, led to the war and the way how the war was planned. Uh, and and, and um, as an as expedition, um, colonial expedition, but also expedition of liberating the Ukrainians from the oppression of the nationalists and Nazis led by Volodymyr Zelensky. So that's that's one historical aspect. Another historical aspect it's it's uh, thinking about the immediate the immediate origins of the war. And I spent a fair amount of time talking about the post 1991 uh, era, the post 1991 period, the the divergence and the development of Russia and Ukraine as, as political systems. And uh, also in the geopolitical context uh, related to the to the issues of European Union, NATO, uh, creation of the Eurasian Union in the in the larger part of the, of the post-Soviet space. So this is this is uh, um, in context number two again, historical one. And the third one was the, something that I just talked about. And that is the, the impact on the on the changing of the world. And uh, the, yeah, I see this impact on two levels. The first one is in terms of the long history of relations between Russia and Ukraine. And the concept of the uh, big Russian nation, as, as Putin has been described to, the idea that Russians, Ukrainians, and 
Belarusians by extension allowing the same people. That's that's not new concept. It has deep roots in the 19th century. So th there is a major change in transformation. They're certainly on the Ukrainian side, and they don't have enough data, but I suspect on the Russian side as well. Another another level where this war has a major impact is certainly the uh, rearrangement of the uh, global order. Um, I have a separate chapter that is dedicated to the, um, uh, which is called the return of the West. So we see the rebuilding of the transatlantic alliance that existed during the Cold War. We also see signs of reemergence of the um, alliance between Moscow and Beijing that existed again during the Cold War in the 1950s uh, for a short period of time. Uh, but also, I, I while uh, tracking this kind of historical parallels and looking for the precedents, I uh, try to make it as clear as possible that I subscribe to the to the uh, Marx Twain's definition of of history and and repetition or not repetition of history, who said that history doesn't repeat itself; it rhymes. So in following the rhymes without without trying to get into the trap of claiming that we are the, 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 we are exactly in the situation like existed during the Cold War. There are some parallels, but there are some significant differences as well. I will be more than happy to talk about the parallels and differences as we move into the, to the discussion stage of, of our, our our conversation, and I certainly will be more than happy to go deeper into the issues that I just touched in, in, in this presentation, issues of identity, religion, language, culture, and others that you know, might be of interest. So thank you, okay. thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to start the, mm -hmm. to, to make the opening statement, and I certainly look forward to, to your questions and our, our change of thoughts and perspectives. Likewise, and uh, I do intend to ask more about a couple of points that you made. I want to give a note to the audience that we encourage you to enter your questions into the Q&A uh, as Sergei and I discuss a few questions that ha I have for him, after which uh, I'll read your questions to Sergei. Um, so one of the questions is something you touch on in your afterward. Uh, actually, let's begin with with uh, sorry the the title of the work because the Russo Ukrainian War uh, could have been let's say uh, labeled Putin's invasion of Ukraine or Putin's war, which is the title of one of your chapters, or Putin's atrocious and unlawful invasion, <laughs> something more dramatic, right? Just for the sake of argument. Uh, but why did you decide on on this formulation? Uh, is it because of its links to the past? Uh, or is it more focused on this moment? Yeah. Well, thank you. It's it's uh, um, a question that I gave a lot of thought to, uh, and indeed there were a number a number of possibilities to to call this war, to think about it, and the the name that you give to to anything certainly certainly reflects also your, your understanding and framing of the event. One thing that was very clear for me is that uh, the the uh, Putin's war, which is indeed titled one of the chapters, would not work for the for the book as a whole, well, and uh, would not work on two levels. The first one is that what I try to do here is actually to look at the at the laundry history of relations between Russia and Ukraine. And uh, also to look at the at the uh, some preconditions for this war that certainly predate Putin and, and Putin's and, and Putin's rule. I look at the war as basically a continuation of the story of the disintegration of the Russian Empire. I look at this uh, in the same context as many other wars created by the fall of empires. Uh, I look at that, at the preconditions being already there, uh, certainly in 1991 and early 90s, 
one of the sections of the book is is uh, entitled unless my editors crossed it out and, and, and gave a different title but what i remember is why didn't they fight in 1991 so mm-hmm. that that broader perspective is one of the reasons the second reason is that calling it Putin's war really would mean ignoring not just uh, big chunks of history, but also ignoring the fact that the uh, uh, Russian public, less so now, but solidly was behind this war. The Putin's ratings went through the roof after the annexation of the Crimea. The annexation of the Crimea, that's the actual start of the war, not the 20, not, not the February 24th, 20, 22. Uh-huh. And in that sense, uh, again, uh, I, I think uh, I think about this as, a, as a, not just Putin's war, but Russian war in general. I, I hope that that the outcome of this war will change the Russian society, will change, will change certain attitudes, not just to the war, but to to the country its own, to, to identity as its own, but what we see today clearly, clearly uh, uh, tells us about, about the, the Russia's war. Um, what what uh, Ukrainian uh, component does in that, in that title, and, and sometimes I was asked, okay, you, you put them as equals, one is aggressor, another is victim. Here it's, it's, it's sort of neutral. For me, the, 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 the sense of also the, this Ukrainian component and the name Russo-Ukrainian war suggests um, the, the, the reality of the war that we didn't, didn't maybe even expect before the um, yeah. February of 2022. The war was planned from the Russian side as a classic uh, colonial expedition was called and still called officially the uh, special military operation. So that's sort of a thing that you do in, in, in a colony. You, you go, you, you capture the capital, you install the, the puppet government. It's, it's a limited, limited military operation. And uh, the resistance to that sort of wars in the colonial context comes out of the partisan resistance and partisan struggle. And that's what many expected uh, mm-hmm. after, after the start of the war. First of all, blitz. Kiev falls within two days, the war over in, in uh, two weeks, and there would be a resistance, some sort of guerrilla resistance and partisan resistance. And the US was uh, sending a clear signal to Russia that uh, US would support that resistance. But that was mm-hmm. the, the horizon. That was the, the thinking about the war. Within the first uh, days, and especially within the first weeks, it became clear that um, the the uh, Ukraine, the former the former um, territory of, of the Soviet Union, actually uh, not only has a nation that united defending itself, it also has a state, and it has an army mm-hmm. that that fights back and fights back quite quite effectively. And uh, the first the first. Um, um, successes of uh, forcing the Russian troops to leave Kiev area uh, in, in March was achieved with minimal uh, Western support, absolutely minimal. Ukraine was at that time fighting with its own weapons, with its own army, of course. And and at the end, that turned out to be something that was planned as a colonial expedition, turned out to be the war between two countries and states. So with this title, I'm also given given um, agency to uh-huh. Ukraine, Ukrainian nation, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian state, Ukrainian armed forces, which I think um, any other title could, probably would not reflect. Right, would maybe that, that, that victimize would Ukraine. Yes. Yeah, well, you speak, you write about the, uh, a defining moment along the lines of uh, Ukraine's resistance that was shocking, which is Zelensky. There's that wonderful video that's now famous where he says, yeah, tut, muy, tut. It's, you know, he points to his inner circle saying, I'm here, we're here, we're not going anywhere. And you speak about this moment as, you know, as having this ripple effect across the nation where the, the people decide 
to fight, not just the army, right? I mean, the people join in and, and led by his example, because there was an attempt on him, there was an assassination attempt on him, allegedly by Chechen ass assassins, it didn't phase him, he stayed put, and he, in the way that he could, fought and, and was defiant. Uh, this, mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense that you would grant them agency backed by Zelensky's defiance or led by uh, Zelensky's defiance in that defining moment when they, when Russia, like you said, thought that they would collapse. Yes. yes. Um, so a running Russo-Ukrainian theme in, in the history that you point out is, is how, whether it's Tsarist Russia, the Soviet Union, or the now autocratic Russian Federation, is how they emphasize fraternity with Ukraine. Insofar as it serves their imperial demands, of course, historically speaking, Russia says more or less to Ukraine, we are brothers. Now, shut up and do what I say or I'll destroy you, <laughs> right? And that's no worse simplification, but it, it, it gets the gist across. Is this the kind of imperial logic that, that tires Ukrainians of hearing from Russians that they are their brothers and sisters? And what is this war done to the fraternity between Ukraine and Russia? Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for this question. That reminded me about um, old uh, Soviet era joke when uh, someone asks uh, another person um, how we are going, they, they found something and the, the question is how we are going to divide it in a brotherly manner or we will divide it equally. <laughs> so the brotherly <laughs> manner Right, and right. It is not equal. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is not equal. Respect among and, equals goes out the window. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. And and that's that's basically goes to the core of this uh, of this idea of um, one nation and uh, one people, which on the surface suggests that we are equal, and uh, in reality suggests that you don't exist. Right. Because what what the argument is, the argument is not that uh, Russians are really Ukrainians. The argument no. is that Ukrainians are really Russians. Right, and, and right. It's one way. They don't they don't exist. So that's that's where the the uh, brotherly part gets in, and and the part of equality or equal divide or any right. sort of equality moves moves outside of the picture. Um, um, the, the idea is is basically uh, not new. Uh, what we see is that it is being formed in the mid 19th century, becomes really the official position of the Russian Empire uh, uh, around that time. And uh, then from there gets to the memoirs uh, and writings of the people whom uh, Putin and Russian leadership uh, reads and, and, and keeps in high regard. Uh, the Russian generals like Anton Denikin. And uh, I uh, write about that in my in my mm -hmm. uh, book that uh, I, I put a lot of emphasis on writings of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, Solzhenitsyn is known and, and uh, highly respected uh, and, and for a good reason for his fight against communism. And his weapon in fighting the communism was Russian nationalism or some form of Russian nationalism. Mm -hmm. But that form of Russian nationalism was very much pre, pre uh, an imperial one. So Zhenitsyn himself comes from the mixed Russian-Ukrainian background. Mm -hmm. When in the 1990, he writes probably his the best known essay, not, not novel, but the best no, known essay, how we should restructure Russia. He restructures Russia as the state formed out of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, with the parts of northern Kazakhstan settled by the Eastern Slavs. So mm -hmm. his Russian nationalism is, is Slavic nationalism. That's the nationalism, Russian nationalism of the of the imperial period. And he translates it, transforms really into the Russia after 1991. This is one of the ideas that certainly very much embraced by, by Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, on the one hand, it's, it's a, an old imperial idea, which replaces 
it's quite ironically a much more tolerant attitude toward Ukraine within the system of the communist Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Because the Soviet mm -hmm. Union recognized Ukrainians and Belarusians as separate right. uh, entities with some mm -hmm. publics, some form of autonomy. This is all against the Great Terror. This is all against the, the all of the more famine and, and uh, uh, dissidents and all these things. It's, it doesn't remove that. But the official line was that those countries ex and nations existed. What we see now is the return of the imperial model of denying existence of those nations. So mm. in a sense, this war uh, goes uh, and, and, and launched on the basis of the imperial thinking. So Russia trying to move forward by actually looking back and 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 okay. relying on the on the really dated arsenal, ideological, cultural, and other arsenal mm -hmm. I mean, from the 19th century, it doesn't doesn't account for the changes of the 20th century. So. Right, distorted historical precedents, the, right, which the, is Putin's... the failure is inbuilt already in in that right. in, in that ideological foundation of the policies. Yes, you write about the idea of Eurasia uh, and. Trubitskoy, the heritage that goes back to Trubitskoy, uh, and uh, even further. And you also write about how the Mala Russia, little Russia, is an imperial term for Ukraine, which is, to your point, defining Ukraine as Russia, but not Russians uh, as Ukrainian, right? It's little Russia, as in a little brother at best, right of of us who are in charge but again distorting the the, yes. the equality uh that must be present to have any kind of brotherhood right mm -hmm. uh, so along these lines of russia insisting on how russian ukrainians are vice versa uh, russia tries to make the argument of their common Kievan origins uh, could you condense your debunking of russia's Kievan? origins myth for our audience? Uh, well, what we see is uh, Kievan Rus, it's a medieval, uh, really, empire, a major state that covered the territory from the from the Baltic all the way to the to today's central Ukraine, including Carpathians going, going all the way up to Volga. So a major, major state of the medieval period, which consisted of a number of ethnicities, uh, uh, tribes, all, all sorts of different groups. And um, now one of those groups that emerged out of the ruins of Kiev and Rus, emerged geographically, admittedly, on the periphery, uh, makes a claim for the, for the basically ownership, really exclusive ownership of, of Cave and cave and legacy. So it's the, the closest parallel maybe in European history would be the Germans claiming the legacy of Rome, right? Mm -hmm. With the Holy Roman Empire being, mm -hmm. right, being right mm -hmm. there. So that is that is the closest parallel that I have to the to the to the Russian claim. Now mm -hmm. um, uh, one has to distinguish between different types of legacies. If you think in terms of, let's say, dynasty, if you think in terms of the religious uh, tradition, the church tradition, church structure, if you think in terms of the um, language, uh, again, uh, liter and, and written language of the time, church Slavonic, yes, all of that comes to Russia from, from Kiev and Rus. And uh, there, is, there is no question that the the Russians are as much heirs of, of that Kievan Rus heritage as any other group that was in that territory. But where the the problem occurs, and that that's exactly we are going back to the Russia and Ukraine being one and the same people, to equate somehow unity around the written language and on the dynasty with the ethnic and ethnicity. With, mm -hmm. with the spoken language and the local culture, mm -hmm. that's I, where mm -hmm. you have basically the the, the uh, legitimacy of the claims 
become become actually less and less weaker and weaker. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that's exactly what happened in the 19th century with the attempt to translate this this uh, um, 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 the, the legacy in law, in in in, in, in state structures, in, in language, to the to the legacy about about the languages and about mm-hmm. cultures, about modern mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Uh, the the Russian travelers in the early nineteenth century discovered Kiev as the birthplace of of Russia uh, in 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 the chronicles and in the writings. And then go to Kiev and are shocked that they can't understand the language that people speak. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then they come with bizarre ideas like Mikhail Pagodin in mid 19th century saying that, well, we know what happened really. The Mongol in the Kiev was settled by Russians, but the Mongols came and they pushed Russians into the north. And then some other tribes uh, came and, and took over took over Kiev. So that's that's where the the, the argument about the uh, Russian claim for for Kiev on the cultural and linguistic and national grounds started to to get in trouble, and mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it is in trouble till today. It is in trouble till now. So in that particular aspect, in that particular uh, in, uh, area, it is just an ideological construct. And a misleading one, and a very dangerous one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, along these lines, um, your work explores the complexities of Ukrainian identity, particularly in its relationships with Europe and Russia. At the heart of this discussion is the idea of Ukraine as the the gates of Europe, a title of of one of your books, uh, a role that frames the country Ukraine as both a facilitator and a barrier to Europe- European and non European cultures. How do you dissect what is considered European in this Ukrainian context and to what extent does being more European historically imply being less Asian or less Russian? Well, uh, one thing that I realized uh, uh, is that uh, there is no such thing as Europe. (laughs) Good. There's no European continent. Yeah. Uh, there is yeah, no European sure. continent, and mm-hmm. you're dealing with different contracts, constructs, different maps, and different imaginations. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the Greeks were drawing the border in Europe uh, along the Don River, the Thanais, that was the, the, the most northeastern colony that was established. So that was mm-hmm. the end of the universe, that, that was the end of Europe. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Russian uh, uh, Empire comes in the 18th century and says, okay, this is, they got it wrong. Europe goes to the Ural Mountains because after the Ural Mountains starts Siberia, and that's where Russia proper ends and Russian colonies start and begin. So mm-hmm. they try to, to be a, uh, like any other colony in Europe. But they don't have it's it's not a maritime empire. They don't have mm-hmm. seas, so they they go for the for the Ural Mountains to distinguish Russia proper from the Russian colonies. Right. Uh, European Union comes along, and there is a different concept of of Europe that emerges. Mm-hmm. The extension mm-hmm. of the European Union, and and we we move that border of the of the European Union and concept of what is Europe and what is not. Right, right. The, the the point is that Europe is 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 a product of um, to a significant degree of our imagination. Uh, now, what what do I mean when I uh, think about Ukraine as as uh, gates gates of Europe? I think about things actually more tangible that go through the centuries that that survive the rise or the fall of the empire or the emergence of this union or that union. Mm -hmm. For me, the most tangible part that defines good part of of the uh, Eurasian continent, because if the continent is there, it's not European, Mm -hmm. it is Eurasian. There is no also Mm -hmm. Asian continent. 
that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the <laughs> reality. So uh-huh. if you look at that, that Eurasian continent in general, what you see is that maybe the most important uh, feature in terms of ecology is the Eurasian steppes. Mm. That start at uh, in, in Danube area, going all the way to the to the Far East, or far start in the Far East and go to Danube area, mm. and um, that's that's uh, the, the core of uh, um, many many empires and imperial structures in the region, from the Mongol Empire to the Russian Empire later. So that's that's the, the, that step creates to a degree a uh, common space, a uh, 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 habitat for this big, big, huge territorial empires. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ukraine, uh, and what is not part of that is basically home to a different tradition, religious, cultural, political tradition, which we can call Europe. Okay. Which is, mm-hmm. which is center of which is beyond, beyond the step area, where, where mm-hmm. steps end. And Ukraine is right, right on the border. Ukraine is right on the border where the Eurasian steppes comes to an end. It hits the Carpathian Mountains, uh, and uh, the, the new, the new uh, ecological zone starts. The new political zone starts. The new historical mm-hmm. zone is there, and Ukraine right, right on the border of that. Uh, right. You you look also at uh, uh, things like uh, Eastern and Western Christianity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. U- Ukraine is right right on the border of those of of, of that dividing line. Mm-hmm. And what is unique in in my in my uh, opinion about Ukraine is not that it is on one of those borders, step and settled areas in Eastern and Western Christianity. It's one of the very few places and countries that combines two of these borders together. Mm -hmm. One Mm -hmm. hand settled and and, uh, nomadic controlled territories, which become a border between Christianity and Islam. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, the division between Eastern and Western Christianity. Again, we can Mm -hmm. look at the Balkans for for maybe similar similar, Mixture of borders and, and, and boundaries, yes. natural, mm-hmm. except that you don't have step there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Step, step doesn't get into in, into the Balkans. So, um, what what that means also the different different uh, cultures meet each other on the territory of Ukraine, mm-hmm. and they create a reality of its own. So it's they don't just clash. Right. They create the largest existing today uh, uh, Union Church, which is called Greek Catholic Church officially, mm-hmm. a combination of East and West. Again, not, not the only Union Church, but the largest one. Right. You look at the encounter of uh, the, the settled areas and nomadic areas, and you have the Ukrainian Cossacks. Not the only Cossacks. We know Russian Cossacks. We know Don Cossacks. We know... But this is the mm-hmm. only Cossack community that creates a state of its own in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. That, that, that has uh, in, uh, academic institutions or the, the uh, university or college type of institutions, Kiev Mohila Academy, exists mm-hmm. under, under right. the auspices of the Cossack state of the Hetmanate. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, that, that uh, just to, to illustrate to you the, the uh, first of all, the position of Ukraine between "quote unquote" Europe and and Eurasia. I don't talk about Europe and Asia, but Europe and Eurasia. Mm-hmm. But also the 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 historical peculiarities of the place that the encounter of different cultures, different economies, mm-hmm. different ways of life, create create new quality because it's yeah, you, yeah. great, great uh, Greek Catholic Church. Right, and one of the things, fast forward to the post-Soviet era, one of the things that you you point to in this book is how Ukraine's diversity defended them against nationalism, right? That that weakened other so former republics. That is because there was the one day the Zelensky, a Jewish president. There's the Jewish presence. There's there's Islam. There's Muslims. 
uh, there's obviously the the Western Ukrainian uh, population. There's Ukrainian Orthodox Christians. There are Russian speaking uh, Ukrainians, and and so forth. So you say you point to this as the fact that it's kind of like Delphi, where five mountain ranges converge at a single point, but right it, you you would think of it as the belly button of the universe if you looked at the geography right yes, uh, yes, but also, yes. I, I will i will just add you mentioned zelensky was the only uh, president of jewish background anywhere outside of israel but the mm -hmm. uh, recently appointed uh, appointed uh, minister of defense of ukraine is a crimean tatar so mm -hmm. i i don't know how religious and non-religious he is but certainly of the of the interesting he represents mm -hmm. the culture is the mm -hmm. strong mm -hmm. uh, uh, islamic and muslim muslim tradition well this is great we are we've accomplished the goal of sort of inciting questions from our audience i have one very quick one and then we'll turn to wow a very active q a uh, we'll stay a little bit longer if we need to uh just for the purpose of covering uh, this interesting anecdote that you have in here, which is Venedict of in 2008, the editor in chief of, of Echo of Moscow, uh, was asked by Putin in 2008 what he would be remembered for in history books, as many of you you point out, taught history. And he pointed to, he said that he will be remembered for the unification of the Moscow Patriarchate and Rokor, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, which I thought was was fascinating in the Orthodox context, scary, uh, and apart from you know uh, key dissenters within Rokor, still holds, you know, uh, and is under duress, no doubt. But it would be an interesting legacy, and it seemed I was asking you before we went on the air: is this was he needling Putin to say this is all you'll be? Uh, right, but then 2015, that's the same question, and Benediktov says, "Well, what Putin wanted to hear was that uh, Khrushchev returned the Crimea, and Putin took it back." Right, and that was that was the what he wants to be, wanted to be remembered by in history books. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I. I... I, I too found that that anecdote fascinating mm -hmm. in a number of levels, and um, uh, one of them is that uh, it it just confirmed what I believed otherwise or thought otherwise was that uh, this war, among many other things, is also the result of the uh, um, not just particular ideology, but also a system in which one man acquired such an important power and after being in power for so long the question was what will what would be my legacy mm -hmm. and legacy mm -hmm. was formulated very interestingly compared to the to the uh, legacy or the the image of the uh, predecessors of putin in moscow mm -hmm. uh, and before before the, the webinar started, I mentioned also Gorbachev. Gorbachev is remembered, of course, as someone who brought who brought perestroika blastness and the Cold War. The Soviet mm -hmm. Union fell apart. And again, that's where a lot of controversy over that exists. Yeltsin is about democracy. What about Putin? So even the first thing that Venedict suggested to him, probably believing that he would like that, that idea, was... Right. The legacy was linked to Russia, to, to, to Russian mm -hmm. truth, to Russian identity, right. to Russian culture. Right. The, mm -hmm. the so-called return of Crimea is to Russia. And, right. and uh, so um, it's it's uh, formulating formulating your legacy in, in a very different, or thinking about it in a very different terms. And uh, the, the war, of course, uh, by now it's very clear that uh, there is no question that Putin's name will be in history textbook. But I don't think it will be in the way exactly how he mm -hmm. meant it, how he wanted it to be. And the irony of the war is that the war that started under the banner of the Russian-Ukrainian unity and belonging to the one nation really became a major contributing factor to the cutting of whatever connections and ties existed uh, psychologically, mm. politically, economically between Russia and Ukraine. And 
this is this is the impact that will not uh, that will that will last uh, a lasting one. Absolutely mm-hmm. opposite to the goals that were put forward at the start at the start of the quote unquote special military operation. Right, right. Um, I'll be working with the the Q and A. Let's turn to the the questions that we have from our audience. Um, Tamara asked, does the title, the Russo-Ukrainian War, imply leaving out 2008, the war in Georgia, as, as a part of the aggression of, of Putin's regime? Um, it's, it certainly implies that, uh, but uh, uh, that's not what, what is actually in the book. Again, the focus is, of course, on, on Russo-Ukrainian relations. Uh, historically, and this war as the largest war in Europe since the end of World War II. But there is a number of chapters that uh, discuss the post-Soviet period and discuss geopolitical uh, changes in in the region. And the uh, war in uh, its Russo-Georgian war or Russian war in Georgia, whatever the term is, is certainly important important uh, stepping stone toward uh, this uh, the, the the current uh, war that acquired this really global global importance and ramifications. And my personal belief, it's not in the book, but my personal belief that if the reaction of the world in general, West in particular, to the Georgian war would be at least one third of what is to the current war, we would not have the start of the war in Ukraine with the annexation of the Crimea. If the reaction Mm -hmm. to the annexation of the Crimea would be at least half of what is to the reaction to the current war, we would not have this war today. So um, in that sense, the, the, the Georgian war is certainly a very important factor in the escalation of the Russian uh, Russian um, uh, policy in 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 the uh, in, in the former Soviet space, and uh, um, um, the first case really, the first case where Russia uses a military force outside of the borders of the Russian Federation, because before Georgian War, of course, there were two Chechen wars as well. So okay. what, the, the importance of the Georgian war is that this is the first time the army is used outside of the borders of the Russian Federation. Right, right. Uh, we have a we have another question from uh, William Janis at Fordham Law. Uh, will the patriarchates granting the Ukrainian Orthodox Church autocephalous status and the Russian patriarchate's support of the war cause a permanent split in orthodoxy? As a result, is Putin Russia still able to present itself as the third Roman protector of Christianity? Does violence against Christians in the Middle East, Africa, and parts of Asia still help him and Russia despite the fallout from the war? Great question. Um, a great question. Well, one thing that uh, happened in 2022 and didn't happen in 2014. Again, I, I found the start of the war in 2014 with the annexation of the Crimea. So in 2014, the um, uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the Moscow Patriarchate uh, really um, took a position in which it, uh, if not openly supported, uh, the position of the uh, leadership in Moscow and uh, by extension the position of the Russian government, then at least uh, at least uh, took a very um, ambiguous position. In some of the churches, the services mm-hmm. were denied to the to the uh, Ukrainian soldiers, uh, parishioners or, or for Orthodox background who were killed in that war. So there were cases like that as well. What we see with the start of all-out war in, uh, in 2022 is that the leadership of the Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate took a very clear position that contradicted the position of Patriarch Kirill in Moscow, uh-huh. and uh, by def- by extension also certainly Putin's uh, uh, Putin's policies and uh, in the. Uh, uh, statement of Metropolitan Anufri, who is the head of that church, 
what you see immediately turning turning the, the discourse about two brotherly nations or one nation into the discourse about the um, uh, Cain and Abel, and that it's it's about killing the brother, uh, appealing appealing to Putin directly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the uh, in in the new context also it turned out to be that sort of statement and clearly separating itself from Moscow in that sense in terms of the policies turned out to be not enough for many many followers of the church to part of the clergy to the Ukrainian society as a whole and the Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate found itself really now in in a very difficult position. Uh, where the, the demand is growing for really going out of Cephalus, full independence from the from the Moscow Patriarchate, something that mm -hmm. I understand the leadership of the church is not prepared to to go for or to accept for mm -hmm. while separating itself certainly politically from the from its leadership in, in Moscow. Uh, and it, it is it is certainly a major a major new development, even the one that wasn't there at the time of the annexation of the Crimea. Uh, the question of the of the Middle East, it's it's uh, more difficult for me to answer. I, I will, would have to look at that, whether there are indeed connections there, or it's basically things that are happening in around the same time and, and serve as a context, and they have power to influence developments in that way, even without without obvious direct connections, just by, by happening around the same time. I would have to look closer into that. So thank you for that part of the question. I, I didn't think about those connections before. Yes, thank you. Uh, our, our next question comes from Victor, who writes, uh, you noted that the Russian perspective is that Ukraine is simply a, a subset of the Russian people. Uh, external observers, as Ukraine seeks to join the EU, have noted that Ukraine's recent attitude to its own minorities, such as the Carpatho Rusins, are simply a subset of the Ukrainian people. This echoes the Russian attitude to Ukrainian culture. Uh, the Ukrainian and Russian attitudes to minorities in some cases are quite similar. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, uh, what we have really uh, is, is the process of the nation building that is still not over. Uh, clearly, if you have uh, um, one nation imagining that other is just a subset and that leads to the war, that's that's a clear, clear indication that uh, this process is, didn't didn't come to the to the uh, some form of uh, eventual eventual settlement, and uh, the. Um, uh, identity of the uh, Russians and the group that lives partially in Ukraine, partial, partially in Slovakia. There are also uh, groups in, in Poland. This is something that is still in the flux, something that is 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 being developed, and uh, uh, we don't know really yet yet the outcome. The um, mm, mm, Part of the group that is called Rusins by the proponents of the Russian, Russian separate identity consider themselves to be Ukrainians. Other consider them uh, to be Rusins. So this is not far away to a degree from the divisions that existed within, within the Ukrainian society where part of Ukrainian Putin elite considered themselves to be little Russians. Mm -hmm. They were cited Shevchenko, but they still believed that they were part of the big Russian nation. Mm -hmm. In Galicia in the 19th century, there was a strong movement of Moscophilia and Russophiles who considered themselves to be Russians, but, all, but part of the, of the big Russian nation. The Russians mm -hmm. of, of today don't consider themselves to be part of the big Russian nation, which is a change. So we are we are in the in the process of nation building that is has not has not came to the full fruition, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the one thing that actually uh, and one lesson from that story is that uh, the, uh, the the violence the, the the restrictions the suppression 
is really uh, not the way to go, not only because it's morally unacceptable, except especially in the, in the modern world, but because mm -hmm. the example of Ukraine shows very well that it is highly ineffective. The nation, the nation that unites over idea of, of, of its identity, of, of its, uh, of its uh, common vision of the past, common vision of the future, no empire, no, no repressive system can actually respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, John Choi asks, what truth is there in the theory of some American professors one prominent University of Chicago emeritus, emeritus professor of international relations and a minority of liberal commentators that the USA reneged on promises from Bill Clinton and even from Joe Biden when he was an envoy to Vienna, uh, that NATO would not expand to include Eastern European countries bordering Russia, to which failed promises Putin responded in defense of this imminent threat from the West to Russian security. You, discuss this in your book. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yes, I, I, I discuss. And my basically uh, advice to um, anyone who basically advances this this position is to read uh, first an article and then a book by uh, Mary Sorotti. The article on the negotiations on NATO was published in the uh, Foreign Affairs and the book, not, not one inch or not an inch, was published, it seems to me, last year, specifically dedicated and uh, to, the, to the issue of NATO negotiations. And uh, uh, the uh, clear conclusion that I draw from that book and also from the documents that are being available is that the issue of NATO expansion or not expansion was discussed during negotiations numerous times. There were made offers and counter offers. The agreement was never reached and the agreement was never reached either uh, in oral form or in written form. So each side left with basically their own thinking and interpretation before reaching any sort of agreement. And what you see, what you see in, in this statements about promises made is the lack of evidence and uh, at best, there is a hearsay. There is no one single document, internal or otherwise, that would support that. So this is something that uh, politically was very important for um, uh, Russian politicians and Russian negotiators to bring back home uh, that, that that sort of impression, and that is being being uh, really exploited again and again. So the. The question that I have to anyone who takes this position, uh, uh, please, please produce some some form of evidence. And, right. uh, 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 but but please start with writing actually with, with reading historians who specifically dedicated uh, months and maybe years of research looking into that specific subject. Not an inch candidate um, on my reading list. Was Ukraine recognized as an independent country at the Yalta conference and admitted to the UN? If so, what is Russia's argument that it is Russia? Uh, well, uh, what you see is that um, uh, I talked a lot about ideology. And uh, uh, one thing that we also shouldn't forget is that uh, the politicians generally are very opportunistic as well. And uh, Putin, depending on the circumstances, really uh, looks no, not only at uh, uh, the writings of Solzhenitsyn or the, the ideas of uh, uh, one uh, big Russian nation, but Michael, as you mentioned before, Trubetskoy and Eurasianism, something that evolves into Dugin, so Eurasian mm -hmm. idea is behind the, 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 the basically policy of creating Eurasian Union. Uh, uh, so the same the same was story with Stalin. So depending on the on the circumstances, there can be communist ideology that could be uh, could be uh, exploited uh, on other in other situations when it fitted his interests. He would talk about Ukraine as a as a, 
if not fully independent, then at least semi-independent country. Uh, the, the irony of the situation is that uh, it's not only um, uh, Stalin and the Soviet Union that was trying to play that card and push the not sovereign, but clearly already well-established territories or countries into United Nations as a proxy world. So you know, Churchill supported Stalin on the issue of Ukraine because Stalin supported Churchill on the issue of India, that at that time mm. was still calling. Mm. And uh, that's that's was granting the UN status as an independent state was uh, used uh, as a tool by the imperial powers, the British Empire and the Soviet Union at that time. But over the period of time, it turned out that that was, uh, that was basically something that it would happen. India became independent. Ukraine became independent. Uh, so again, the 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 overall answer to that question is that uh, uh, the politicians are quite opportunistic and and they're not as strict ideologues and act at uh, out of their immediate interests and then look for for justification. They recognize in Ukraine as as a separate enough to be worthy membership in the UN, and then of course controlling Ukrainian vote. That was a proxy vote for the Soviet Union. Mm. And the same thing certainly was with the British Empire with regard to India, which again didn't that that arrangement didn't last for them. We'll take um one more question from our QA and then leave a little bit of room for some closing comments. Uh, John Borelli as uh, says, Professor Plohi, you, you see the present war as a further disintegration of the Russian Empire, to, uh, confirmation of his. Is, is this war also the further disintegration of the Russian Orthodox Church? Um, <clears throat> um, the short answer is yes. And um, basically, I look at this process uh, the same way how I look at the process of the disintegration of the Russian Empire as uh, really catching up to a degree with the processes that have been happening in the world in general. Uh, the, the uh, um, again, Russian Empire, the Soviet Union controlled one sixth of the world. You don't control one sixth of the world by being a nation state. Not really, but does it happen? <laughs> just you look at you look at the map and you recognize empire right away. Mm. And uh, uh, you you don't see that sort of possessions uh, uh, with regard to Britain. You could see them in the map coming from 1945. Mm -hmm. it's, it's gone. So that's that's the same the same trend, the same the same process. When it comes to the churches, again, the norm that exists certainly in the Eastern Christianity is autocephaly and autocephalous churches in independent, in independent states. So the struggle of Ukraine for independence automatically, or at least in historical terms, leads to the to the autocephaly and independence of that of that church something that we see in bulgaria much earlier on something that we see also to a degree in yugoslavia on different levels so i i see just the the, the ukrainian case uh, following particular patterns both when it comes to the disintegration of empires and when it comes to the formation of national orthodox churches I, I don't see any signs on the horizon suggesting that somehow the Ukrainian case would be different from, from more or less established trends in, in, in the world history. You point out in, in your book how uh, this war has unified the West against not just the West, but the former uh, republics, not all of them, but most of them against Russia, right, which was um, anti uh, anti-imperial, uh, according to Putin's design, right? Um, nobody wants to be Russian who is not Russian, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Or nobody wants to be under Russian power. Uh, if they're not Russian, they, there's this lean into NATO and the EU as a means of self-determination, it seems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, which, you know, is popular among Ukrainians. And even you point out... Uh, 
Russian, ethnically Russian Ukrainians, uh, you know, 54% of the Crimea are in favor of it. Is that right? I, I, I don't want to misquote the exact number, but yeah, they, it's a popular. They, Ukrainian, mm -hmm. uh, Ukrainian vote for independence in 1991, the majority was in every region, including in the Crimea. So that the data comes from 1991, 54% voted for Ukrainian independence. Mm -hmm. Right. We we don't have any any other data to rely on the mm -hmm. so-called referendum of 2014. There were no observers. It was happening under the conditions of the military occupation. Uh, so really, the, the 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 it's difficult to say how representative or not representative it is. But the latest reliable data comes from 91. Well, I thought that we might pause on what you begin your work with, uh, which is the dedication, because it's one thing to sort of delve into the history. Um, this is a complex history of Ukraine and Russia. It's another thing to remember the people who are fighting this battle, really, and dying and sacrificing themselves. So you write it in, in memory of all those who, do, who died defending freedom. There's an ours. Uh, it feels like it's something we must do is to sort of call to presence these people who have, are doing that as we speak. Um, uh, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, the, the, the dedication is quite broad, of course, and it recognizes everyone mm -hmm. in Ukraine uh, who, who, fights, who fights this war. They, they fight for themselves, they fight for their families. But if when people asked about something broader, the, the term that comes most often is about uh, freedom and independence. And uh, that was, uh, again, is not sad by those people with the idea to impress the Western audiences. Mm -hmm. It is partially the, the um, realization that in Ukraine as a political nation, and we talked about that Ukrainians are the, certainly the majority, the, the Ukrainian language is, is growing in its importance today, but it's also a multi, multi-ethnic, multi-religious group that fights together as, as a political nation. And in that sense, to, to, to formulate your desire to fight as for one particular language or for one particular religion or for one particular group is mm -hmm. it simply just doesn't reflect the reality. Yeah. But what Ukrainians realized after 2014, after the annexation of the Crimea, after the war in Donbass, was that the war and specifically Russian war uh, brings, brings destruction, but it also takes away their freedom. Freedom to elect, freedom to say whatever you want to say, Ukraine, even in the conditions of the war, still, still, you, you, you can do all of that. And they started to value something that they had, but they didn't realize that they had. That realization came really this 2014 in many ways. And this formulation about freedom. Uh, when when you start losing something, you start you start also value something. So that's that's why freedom is there and it's it's quite mm -hmm. broad. Uh, but there are also two specific cases. My cousin was died in this war, was killed. And mm -hmm. uh, a brother of one of my acquaintances, mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, again, he wrote to me this picture of his uh, from the front lines, but he was reading one of my books. Um, and uh, and I, I first dedicated book to, to that particular individual, then news came about mm. my, my cousin, and then I realized that uh, basically I, it's, uh, it's, it, it's not just about one individual, it's about, it's about, about everyone who, who goes and fights in Russian and Ukrainian, uh, in Catholic, Greek, Catholic, Orthodox, Muslim, uh, anyone who, who believes that that in Ukraine he defends not only themselves but also defends, defends some basic principles. And uh, again, in Ukrainian case, it's 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 much more than pronouncements. It is it, it is a deep belief when it comes to issues of freedom and independence. 
um, most worthy vener uh, dedication and veneration. So um, I know that you're, you've done an, uh, an amazing job of fielding all of our questions and I'm, and I'm grateful to you for that. Um, thank you for very much for making time to come to discuss this work and help us make sense of it and uh, speak to your experience your personal experience as well uh, in the Russo-Ukrainian war as it unfolds. Um, I thank you for coming and I want to thank uh, the Orthodox Christian Study Center and co-directors, uh, George Zemokopoulos and Aristotle Papanikolaou for the platform, uh, the Associate Director Nathaniel Wood, who is also Managing Editor of the Study Center's publication of scholarly research called Public Orthodoxy. Uh, special thanks to Siobhan Berlesa and Catherine Mandelakis for helping to organize and promote the event. Uh, I want to, while I have you here, mention our upcoming webinar with Serge Schmemin. And um, we're going to talk, he's a, a New York Times editorial member and Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Uh, we're going to take a retrospect retrospective look at his Echoes of a Native Land, Two Centuries of a Russian Village released in 1999, just as Putin was transferring to power. Uh, it's a captivating nonfiction about culture, faith, and identity that is a must read for anyone seeking connection to their roots. Um, Serhi, you're, you're invited as well. I'll be sure to send you an invitation. Well, if I, if I can uh, um, just jump in and- Of course. Thank, thank you for this invitation, for this conversation. Thanks a lot for uh, to the to the viewers and listeners for questions. Um, I'm a little Excellent bit questions. now mm -hmm. with language. I want to say that I enjoyed the conversation. The, 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 the topic is of course terrible, but really, really, right. I, I, I certainly found it's very, very, very stimulating, very important. Thank you for that. I'm very happy to hear that. And uh, thank you again. We'll see you with the, the date for that event is October 27th, by the way. So mark your calendars, same time, Friday at noon. Um, looking forward to it. And thank you again so much, Sergei Polgi. Thank it's you. Honored to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, have a good day.